Beyond Positive Thinking, No-Nonsense Formula for Getting the Results You Want by Dr. Robert Anthony. Chapter 1, Positive Thinking, Negative Thinking, Right Thinking. The starting point of making permanent and lasting changes in your life begins with the understanding of the difference between positive thinking, negative thinking, and right thinking. Think of the one person who sits down to play the piano, and as he is there, there is no harmony, there's no balance, there's no real tune because he keeps hitting all the wrong notes. The player eventually gets fed up with the disharmony, lack of pleasure, and lack of enjoyment in his music and decides to go to, go to the teacher. The teacher says, you have the ability to play, but you need to understand music. Each one of us has the ability to play the game in the game of life with balance, harmony, joy, but we need to know that there's rules and principles. Life works accordingly to the principles and physical law. If it didn't, you couldn't fly an airplane because there'd be no gravity. There would be no such thing as electricity. One plus one would not equal two. The laws of the universe are totally dependable. Universal law is not only dependable, but it's also unchangeable. You could depend on it, but it will work every time. In essence, the universe will never let you down. It doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, how short you are, how fat you are, how skinny, how religious, how na how your nationality, or whether you are male or female. The power of the force, the energy is neutral, and it will direct it through its own ideas and beliefs. The power of the force or the energy is neutral, and we direct it through our own ideas and beliefs. The word is law. Your word is law. What we are saying is that your word is the law in the universe, but you need to know these laws. Without understanding of the laws through ignorance, you cannot create what you want. The fundamental law from which all others conform is the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect says that the effects of the results of any situation must be equal to the cause. The cause is always an idea or belief. Another way of describing the law of cause and effect, for example, of sowing and reaping, or action and reaction, or put in modern day context, my ideas are created into my results. The law of cause and effect is impersonal. Just like sunshine, if you are standing in the sun, you receive the warmth and the healing benefits of the sun rays. If you're standing in the shade, it seems like the sun isn't shining on you, but you move into the shade. But who moved you into the shade? Who moved you into the darkness? The truth is we are in, we are in the darkness because of our own ignorances. The problem of ignorance, I repeat, the law of cause and effect is impersonal. This is why we can see so many people who are basically good have so many problems and disasters in their lives. Somewhere in their lives, this person has misused, misunderstood the law, and it doesn't mean that he or she is bad. It doesn't mean that he or she isn't a loving person. It just means that through ignorance and misunderstanding, the person has misused the law. This can be applied to any natural law. For instance, aerodynamics, aerodynamics and gravity will kill you if you will kill you, but... A, misunderstood, a misunderstanding of it, of its functions will, even if you are kind and loving positive persons, a misunderstanding of its functions and it will. The universe is like a river. The river keeps on flowing and it doesn't care whether you are happy or sad, good or bad. It just keeps on flowing. That's what life is. People go down to the river and then they cry. Some people go down to the river and they are happy, but the river doesn't care. It just keeps on flowing. We can cause it, we can use it, enjoy it, and we can jump in or drown. The river just just keeps on flowing because it's impersonal. And so with its universe, the universe that we live in, we can support us, it can support us in our, or destroy us. It's our interpretation and use of the laws of, that we determine our effects and results. We can only receive what our minds are capable of accepting. We can go to the river of life with a teaspoon, some else may go with a cup. Someone else may go with a bucket and another may go with a barrel. But the abundance of the river is always there and waiting. Our consciousness, our ideas, our frame of reference, our belief system determines whether we go in this river of life with a teaspoon or a cup or a bucket or a barrel. Now, if we are impoverished in our thinking, we have gone to the river of life with all with only a teaspoon, we've cursed a little for we have in this little teaspoon and that's all we complain about. We may curse others to have more than what we do, but remember, whatever we curse will curse us. The river is there and it's overflowing with abundance. We can come over to the river with a life, with a teaspoon, a bucket or a barrel, any time that we want to. What we take from the river of life is up to us. The only limitations is in our mind. The truth is that we can have anything we want if we'll just give up the belief that we cannot have it. It's as simple as that. Beliefs become limitations. All of our experience has led us to believe certain things about ourselves. Whether these beliefs are true or not really doesn't really matter because if we accept them as true, they are true for us. And if we speak our words long enough, they become the law of the universe. Pronounce your limitations vigorously enough and they're yours. Whether you believe this are true or it's total ins totally insane, if you accept them, then that's what your life will be about. Whether your beliefs are true or totally insane, if you accept them, then that's what your life will be about. 
Once you have accepted this idea, it's an idea whose time has come, and there is nothing that can stop it. Once you've accepted this idea. Now, if we have accepted this idea and the lack of limitation, it is an idea whose time has come for us. There's nothing that you could do about it and except for changing your, of your mind. If you plant a seed, it is going to grow. If you plant a tomato, you will have a tomato. The tomato won't change its mind to become a cucumber because it thinks a cucumber is better for you. The soil will give you tomatoes as long as you keep planting them, even if you're allergic to tomatoes. Look, as Look at the beliefs that form your groundwork of your life. We are full of beliefs that we collected over the years. Attitudes, ideas, opinions, conditioning. We are also full of so many ideas. Challenged us that we dig in our own heels and often think, Don't tell me anything new. I have my beliefs together and I know how... And I know together and how dare you try to change my ideas. This is what I've based my whole life on. Now, you're telling me I could be wrong? I don't want to hear that. We live with a set of beliefs called religion. It's a set of beliefs called politics, a set of beliefs called ourselves, a set of beliefs called about the kind of people that we like and the kind of people we don't, and a set of belief about everything else. Many of the things that we believe, garnered from the past experience, groups of people, individuals, are not true, but they are the things that we have imagined to be so true at the end from which at the end of our need to survive, because the will to survive is the desire for certainty and strong. We've created rules about the nature of life and how it unfolds. These rules become beliefs. Unfortunately, those beliefs can also become limitations. Breakthroughs, breakthrough mistaken beliefs. Breakthrough mistaken beliefs. The fact of the matter is that we can only be successful to the degree from which we are willing to shed our mistaken beliefs. When we experience sickness, failure, or lack of, it is often because of the limitations of our own minds. The sad thing is that, even though that we know our lives aren't working in certain areas, we are still afraid to change. We've locked into a comfort zone, no matter what our self-destructive, self or how destruct, self-destructive it may be, yet the only way to get out of our comfort zone is to be free of problems, limitations, and limitations is to get uncomfortable. We can only experience freedom in a direct proportion to the amount of truth from which we are willing to accept without running away. We must stop kidding ourselves, stop blaming others, and stop avoiding unpleasant decisions, and start facing the truth that we may have accepted unworkable beliefs, that they are the direct cause and effects of our own lives. Our own beliefs have been the direct cause and effect of our own lives, and it is not a question of going from negative thinking to positive thinking. It's a matter of moving towards the right thinking. Again, right thinking in parentheses which means moving towards knowing the absolute truth about who we are and our relationship to life right thinking which is based on truth and not illusion in the foundation that determines the solidity of all of the thinking positive thinking and negative thinking are both filtered through our belief system right thinking comes from being aware of the truth or the reality of any situation again right thinking comes from being aware of the truth or the reality of any situation being aware of the truth or the reality of any situation Knowing the truth sets you free. Always, always seek to know the truth about any situation in which you are involved. Look behind the present belief system, asking yourself a higher, what is the truth about this? The higher self will always reveal the truth to you if you are ready to hear it. When you act upon the truth, you are using right thinking. It's not a matter of being positive or negative or simply being yourself. And when you are yourself, which means you are allowed of being in a higher self, to reveal the truth, Every situation you are involved in will resolve itself perfectly. This might sound magical, but it is only the law of cause and effect in action. The starting point of success. Starting point of success. The aim of all great teachers since the beginning of time has been awakened us for the fact that we create our own reality. More importantly, they have taught us that we are responsible for everything that happens in our lives. This includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. If we believe that someone or something outside of ourselves is the cause of our problems, then we will always look outside of ourselves for the solution in order to find the true answers of our problems. We must begin looking at ourselves in a new way, will, which will cause us to see people and events in a new way. The outer world in many ways is a reproduction of our inner world. You must realize that how many troubled people do you know who have not given the slightest attention to this fact? No amount of determination, no amount of willpower, inspiration, or motivation will solve the problem if we look outside of ourselves for the answer. The law of attraction. Everything comes to us by the most elemental laws of physics. Like attracts like. Like attracts like. This is called the law of attraction. The law of attraction, like all natural laws, operates in the mathematical exactitude. Exactitude. It is an impartial impersonal, which means it works when you want it to and when you don't want it to. It has nothing to do with your personality, religious beliefs, being good or bad, being a good or a bad person, or anything else. No one lives beyond this law. It is irrefutable law in 
it's as real as the law of gravity, the law of attraction. Before the law of gravity was identified, nobody knew it existed, and yet everyone was still affected by it. Such is the cause of laws of attraction. Most people are unaware of the mechanics of how it works, and yet everyone is still affected by it. You don't need to know the mechanics of how the law of gravity works, but you do keep yourself floating, but it does keep yourself from floating off into space. You also do not need to know the mechanics of how the law of attraction works, for it is a function in your life. You may not have realized it until now, but everything you've experienced in your life is invited, attracted, and created by you. There's no exceptions. That you may not be in some good news of your life. There are no exceptions. That may not be some good news in your life not going the way you want it to. And since most of us are not too happy with what we've created in our lives, we become highly gifted masters of attracting an overabundance of circumstances that we would rather not have. The mind attracts whatever is familiar to itself. The frightened mind attracts frightened experiences. The confused mind attracts confusion. The abundant mind attracts more abundance. Since we attract what we think about, it makes good sense to become aware of the subconscious thought patterns that control our lives. To become aware of our subconscious, our subconscious patterns that control our lives. You are always right. The primary function of the subconscious mind is to follow the instructions of the conscious mind. It does this by proving, by proving, whatever the conscious mind believes is true. In other words, the job of the subconscious mind is to prove the conscious mind is always right. So, if you consciously believe that you can't be, do, or have something, the subconscious mind will create the circumstances and find the people to prove that you are right. The subconscious functions like the automatic pilot of an airplane. If an autopilot is set to go east, then you commandly override the controls to go north. But as soon as you let go, the automatic pilot, which has been programmed to go east, will control the plane, and you will fly east. Your subconscious does not change the reality of the world around you. It just filters the information that you present to it in order to support your beliefs and or the pictures that you hold in your mind. For example, if you believe the business is bad, then there's no opportunity for the business. Your subconscious will ignore the opportunities to improve your business. Instead, it will only point out the problems in your support and beliefs that the things are bad and that there's no new opportunities. Your subconscious can think for itself. It will draw you to only those things from which you're consistent with your deepest inner beliefs. Your subconscious cannot think for itself. It will draw you only to those things that are consistent with your deepest beliefs. Nothing more, nothing less. If you do not know this is the truth yet, and do not realize that you create your own reality based out of your own ideas, you will feel powerless to change your life, to change your life for the better. Instead, you will feel that you are the victim of people's circumstances and conditions. If you accept yourself as a powerless as you look at something else or someone else outside of yourself to fulfill your desires, when you become... When you come to an understanding that everything that you want can be created through your mind, through the use of right thinking, which is simply clear thinking, come to the realization that only you can give yourself what you want. Trusting your creative power. To create what you want, you have to trust the power within you. Now, when you are told to trust the power within you, immediately you could say, look at the starvation, look at the starvation, look at the sickness, the war, the crime of the world, you are telling me to trust the power? If this power existed, why would it allow this to happen? Well, the truth is, is it doesn't allow anything to happen. Remember, we said the power of, is the power is actually neutral. It's just a neutral power. It's simply in the power of creation. It's the impersonal force of life. We can use the power and the life force to create anything that we want in our lives. Even if we choose the ignorance, it doesn't matter. It will support us in our ignorance until we learn from it. The effect will always be equal to the cause. And if you want it, if, if we're in a ditch, it means that the power is supporting us of being in a ditch. In our lives and immensely, if, if our life is immensely successful, it means that the power supports us in our success. It all comes out of our own ideas. Through direct power. We said earlier that our ideas are created into results. To put another way, it is done unto you as you believe, nor do you want. But if you believe, there's a vast difference between the two. Again, we said earlier that our ideas are created into our results. To put it another way, it is done unto you as you believe, not as you want. It is done unto you as you believe, not as you want. When you think about the universe and how the universe moves, this means that when you put out an idea out into the universe, people, places, things come into your life to fulfill that idea. When you think we actually cause things to happen. Look at what this power has done to the universe. Look all around you. See all the marvelous creations, infinite in number. The best news of all the time, the power is within you. The more open, responsive, and receptive you are into this power to fulfill 
then the more fulfilling and magnificent your life will be. If this is true, then how does the power work? You and I are indirect users of the power, and let me explain. When you started your car today, what did you have to do? Well, you had to turn the key, and which turned a small starting motor, which in the started the engine. Starting the motor was powered by electricity. Now, what was the direct cause of the electricity? What was, the, was it the battery? No, it wasn't. A battery is not the independent source. It has been charged up. It has been charged up. Your higher self is essentially a battery within that receives its own source, power of energy from the universe. It then stores the power for you to use for the purpose of creation. Again, what is this battery? What, is it a battery? No. A battery is not an independent source. It has been charged up. Your higher self, your higher self is essentially a battery within the, a battery within that receives its source of power or energy from the universe. It then stores that power for you to use for the purpose of creation. In science, there's a formula known as Ohm's Law, which states that C equals E divided by R. C equals E divided by R. C equals the amount of electricity, electrical energy, that is available for your, for your appliance at any place where you are going to plug it in. For example, C equals the amount of electricity to run your toaster, the power to run the appliance to run your toaster divided by R, which is the power line coming into the building where you live at 750,000 volts but it comes into your house at 110 to 220 volts to run your appliances. To do this, the transformers are used on the power line to reduce the power coming into your house, to make it safe for application. This is just like the power available to you. You have the ultimate power of the universe available to you, but it's also an infinite wisdom, which might be referred to as a transformer. While our higher self is plugged into the ultimate power of the universe, this power also has enough wisdom to put some transformers in between to insulate it so we don't get too much before we are ready for it and to burn ourselves out. Now, if you wanted to bring in more power, what do you do? you would have to create less resistance. You would have to change the wiring to accommodate the additional flow of power. How to have more power. The power is like the water. In an early example of the sense of a larger container needing to be carried into great quantities. This cannot expect that just because your higher self is plugged into the universal power or the universe power, intelligence and wisdom of the universe, that you could just turn it on. Because if you did, you would blow yourself right out. So in order to get our lives to work to take greater advantage of this energy we have to build a bigger channel for creative intelligence to flow through to enlarge this channel we have to expand our consciousness expand our consciousness involving expanding our ideas and beliefs regarding ourselves and our relationships to this power as we do this we begin to experience more of the ultimate power and our ability to create great increases the ultimate power and our ability to create greatly increases you and I are creative beings and we always have the capacity to create more. In fact, we are always creating consciously, unconsciously, knowing who we are, the process from which we are expanding our power within. We could begin to move our creation from the unconscious to the conscious. When we create from an unconscious level, when we create from a conscious level, we are able to make choices. When we create an unconscious level, we cannot make choices. So we often hear about how we have to have the power of choice, the power of choice. But that is not entirely accurate. We often hear how we have the power of choice, but it's not entirely accurate. It is misleading to say someone chooses the dysfunctional relationship, money problems, or any other negative situations in his or her life. Most of the time, we are operating in this default mode, which is based on our past conditioning. Choice implies by being conscious, by being conscious. However, when you are unconscious, you cannot make conscious choices. You are operating in the default mode or in an automatic pilot. The default mode is survival mode. This is when your mind takes control without us even being aware of what's happening. Choice begins when you stop identifying with your condition patterns in your past unit. And now, until you reach that point where you identify with your condition patterns of your past, until you reach that point, you are unconscious. This means that you are compelled to think, feel, and act in a certain way according to the conditioning of your mind. When we can make choices, we're no longer the victim of our unconscious reactions. If our unconscious negativity thinking does not support what we want rather than trying to eliminate it we all have to do it we all have to do all that we have to do is center on some right thinking right thinking is a thought pattern that is based on truth truth is by very nature it must always be right whatever the truth is it has to be right right there is no growth without discontent your higher self knows what is best for you all you need to do is assert 
that you want something better than you have right now. Realize that there is no growth without discontent. While it is important to live life in the present moment and accept what it is, it is also important to grow from where we are. Study your dissatisfactions very carefully because it will tell you something about yourself. Your life is an ever-changing canvas. What you're going to paint, now what are you going to paint on it? So ever-changing canvas. Are you going to paint black of limitation? Are you going to paint lack and limitation? If you do, your canvas is going to reflect lack and limitation. Are you going to paint incredible everything? Are you chained to limitations? Have you ever gone to the circus and noticed the great big elephants are tied to a wooden stake? just with a little tiny thin rope. Also, the baby elephant has a big chain around her legs that is tied to a long metal stake that goes deep into the ground. The stake is driven through into the ground into the chain to make it strong enough, and the baby elephant is trained from the baby with a thicker chain. As the elephant grows older, they decrease the size of the chain down to a rope because the elephant was tr trained to not respond to the pull, to not resist. Understand the rules of life. Understand that if your life does not work the way you want it to, it is because you have accepted false beliefs to keep you from being all that you can be. Unfortunately, the majority of people on this planet feel stuck. When they look at the world and start seeing suffering, misery, impoverishment, when we see so many well unintentioned people doing without, the world looks insane. We see people giving up, believing believing that they have to take from others in order to have anything for themselves. Rarely do we think within the answers to this confusion. Rarely does the individual really look to see what the rules of life are. So what happens? In our own ignorance of ourselves and in life, we hassle, fight, and strain to get what we want. In the end, it's not even working anyway. Playing the game of life. Playing the game of life. You see, life is a game. Some people play the game to struggle. Some people play the game of sickness. Some people play the game of poverty. Some people play in the game of being right all the time. Some people play in the game of being late. Some people play the game of happiness, abundance, and health. Happiness, abundance, and health. That's the game you need to play. It just helps to understand that each individual plays the game he or she really sets up. It's no longer game is necessarily better than the other, but the game were not bringing us some sort of payoff, we'd stop playing. If the game wasn't giving us some sort of playoff or payoff, we would stop playing. Look at your own life. Try to see the secret satisfaction that you have out of not being fully in charge of your life. What kind of secret satisfactions could you possibly be in feeling victimized? Well, how could you enjoy even feeling weak or poor or inadequate? The question is the payoff of a pay value. For example, if you play the weak game, others will have to love you, take care of you, and protect you. It's the ultimate way to get attention. But if you play the game being undecided all the time and let other people decide for you, then you are living a protected from blame if you make a mistake. In other words, if you keep both hands tied behind you, then you can expect someone to take care of you, is what it is. In playing the helpless routine, you're actually controlling others. In playing helpless routines, you're actually controlling others. The power of powerless people is remarkable. They are good at making others play the part that they have written for them. Look at the value that you have getting that you are getting out of your own payoff. For example, in being sick, looking at the value that you get out of being sick, you may be saying that this is an insensitive, that this is insensitive and cruel, that you don't know what I've been through. No, it's not cruel. It's crueler to deny it. What you really are saying is that you disease has more power than you do to decide your destiny. The question here is who is giving this illness such a power? If you're experiencing illnesses, you need to take a look at it. And don't pass a judgment on yourself. Don't let it just let it just let it tell you something. Know that no matter what is going on in your body, it begins in your mind. Illness of the body and the reaction of the mind. Since the body is feedback mechanisms of your mind, it will always let you know what is going on with your consciousness and your emotional level. Let your body be your teacher. It is interesting that in our society, it is totally okay to spend $50,000 on a heart attack. But what people would say if they spent the amount of money of just having fun. What would they think if they were crazy? If they would probably, they probably resent you. It seems that we have our priorities mixed up. Perhaps if we spent fifty thousand dollars on having fun, maybe we wouldn't have so many heart attacks. Think about it. Having a pleasure is abnormal. Think about it. Having pleasure is abnormal, but having pain seems to be normal. Waiting is a trap. Why are we waiting to be healthy, to be happy, to be alive, to be wealthy, to start our new business, to fall in love, to communicate, to clear up relationships? Why are we waiting? Waiting is a trap. If we wait for interesting rates to go up or down or up or down for the economy to get better, for a person to change, for the holiday to pass before starting a diet, and but there will always be a reason to wait. Never have a reason to wait. Waiting is a trap. What if help doesn't show up? I knew a beautiful, intelligent young woman who had everything in life for and yet 
She tried to kill herself several times with alcohol and drugs. Do you know why? She always felt something was missing from her life. She didn't know she could create her life the way she wanted it to. Instead, she was waiting for someone to bring her happiness, but that person never ever showed up. Desire to have someone else and some other people provide our happiness and our beliefs that we could provide others happiness amounts for endless processions of social schemes, organized drives for a better world. This desire to have other people provide our happiness or the belief that we could provide others happiness accounts for the endless procession of social schemes and organized drives for a better world. Our major illusion is that we can build a society that functions on higher psychological and spiritual levels than our present level of awareness. Many people urge us to work for a better society or a better world. This is a great error. Since we cannot create anything higher than our own level of awareness, society as a whole doesn't really get much better. Society system for the social change only adds a new burden of top of the old burden. Our overwhelming mind has no idea what we will do if all the social schemes thrust it upon us. But in our desperation to have things better, it forces us to try to make a sense out of nonsense. The people that we are trying to right in the world's wrongs from the outside in. We attempt to reform the outside world by forcing outer conditions to change. Unfortunately, this outside this outside in approach is doomed to failure. This outside looking outside to fix what's within is doomed for failure because we are dealing with the effect instead of the cause. Changing from the inside out, we need to remind ourselves that every individual on this planet that we can have and must change the world from the inside out. We are overwhelming proof that on the outside in approach does not work. The long term solution is poverty, lack and limitation lies in our abilities to turn our inner potentials into a reality. The only way that we can truly heal the world is to heal ourselves first. This is the only new, this is not a new message. But I think that we need to remind ourselves that whoever we are and whatever we are capable of, we need to take responsibility for everything that has happened to us. Through the laws of attraction, we attract either consciously or unconsciously everything that happens to us. Whatever anyone has ever done to us, we have participated in it, and we are at some level responsible. In essence, there's no victims, only volunteers. This is a hard pill to swallow, but unless you accept it, it unless we accept it, we cannot change things for the better. We have become the culture of blamers, yet... If you if your wrist, wrist rush shows the wrong time, what would you do about it? Would you ask the neighbor? Would you ask the neighbor for their watch to set their watch according to yours? Or would you correct your watch? Unfortunately, we do not make similar corrections when our lives are not working. Instead, we insist on the reality should conform to our illusions. The starting point of success? Your unlimited power lies in your ability to control your thoughts. A confused mind works in the direction of sickness, poverty, lack, and limitations rather than the direction of abundance, health, and success. If we are not creating our lives the way that we want them to be, then we are creating from an un unconscious. And since life is a consciousness, the most important task that we have is developing a higher possible consciousness. Higher possible consciousness. We can do this by looking at the conditions of our lives and challenging beliefs, even if our ego is threatened. Whenever we want something in our lives, we must let go of anything that is between what we want to believe and what we want. In your heart, you know exactly what you want. And if you will listen to your intuition, it will tell you. Your mind will sell, will sell you out, but your intuition never will. Your intuition is the connection from your ultimate power. Learn to trust it. People control People can control you through their through your mind, but they can never control you through your intuition. We imagine we will lose some something by following our intuition, but have never taken a look at what we have lost by no following of your intuition. Whatever your intuition is telling you, it is what you need need to heat. It is what you need to hear. Whatever your intuition is telling you is what you need to hear. As you learn to trust more and more, it will reveal exactly what you need to do at any given moment. Your life is important. It's important to you. It's important to the rest of the people on this planet. I believe your every person on this planet arrives here for a mission. If you will listen to your intuition, your purpose, or your mission in life will be revealed to you. Chapter 2. The Truth About You If you want to take control of your life, it's important that you gain the basic understanding of who you are. Who you are, our self-image, or what is the picture of ourselves that we hold in our minds becomes the key to our lives. All of our actions, feeling, behaviors, and even our abilities are consistent with our formed pictures. We literally act upon the kind of person that we think that we are. What we need to be aware of is that as long as we hold onto that picture, no amount of willpower, effort, determination, commitment will cause us to be any other way. Because we are always going to act in the way that we see ourselves. To be any other way, we must first look at how we form our self-image. Our mental blueprint. 
From birth onward, we collect hundreds of ideas about ourselves, about being good, bad, wise, stupid, confident, fearful, fearless, and so on. Through repetition, these often false identities harden into our self-image. The self-image either allows us to be happy or successful or terror tyrannizes our lives. Whether we realize it or not, within ourselves is the mental blueprint. The mental blueprint. It's a picture of the way that we think that we are. The blueprint is exactly to complete down to the last detail. The summary of the blueprint is our own self-image. However, this blueprint is not who we are, but rather who we think we are. The circumstances and conditions that have formed our self-image may have only totally erroneously or blown out of proportion. But as far as we are concerned, they are true. Once we record this information, we do not question its validity. Most of the time, we can't even consciously recall how or where we obtain the information. We just live our lives as if we thought it was true, even if it's not true. We believe it's true. The secret of the ages. The secret of the ages. The vast majority has missed the message of all the great teachers. Since the beginning of the recorded history, it has tried to share with their fellow human beings. The secret of the ages, the most incredible truth um, the very few realize is that at being level, which we will call your higher self, the secret of the ages is one most incredible truth that very few realize. The secret incredible truth is that the being level, the being, as in human being, we will call out your higher self, your higher self. You are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. Just as a drop of water has all the quality of the ocean, you have all the quality of the, of the creator within you. Science, philosophy, and religion all teach us that in their own way that there's ultimately one power of the universe and that's we're one with the power the energy the force and whatever you're comfortable with you and I are individuals individualized expressions of the overall power of the universe this can be called our higher self we can destroy we can never destroy the higher self within us we can destroy who can deny that that's there we could try to hide from it we can lie about it we can ultimately but we cannot f change the fact that it's who we are we need to do what we need to do is recognize that it is who we are and learn how to channel it through our thoughts of who we are. Who you are and what you do is not the same. What we understand, the distinction between who we are and what we do, who we are is a spiritually perfect, but what we do is not always perfect. The gap between who we are and what we do is created through ignorance. When we don't know that we are spiritually perfect, it follows that our actions will be less than perfect. I'd like you to do something right now. Just say to yourself, I know who I am is spiritually perfect. I know who I am is spiritually perfect. Now listen to the little voice in your head. It's probably saying, oh no, I'm not. The affirmation of perfection seriously threatens your ego. Your ego immediately sends it back to the response, what do you mean you're perfect? Come on now, take a good look at yourself. Look at the way that you are, how you treat other people. Remember what you did yesterday. You're always complaining. How about the way that you treat your mother, your father, your boss, your mate? How about the way you treat yourself? Remember the terrible thing you did back in 1986. How can you say you are spiritually perfect after that? Remember the terrible thing you did back in 1986? How could you say you're perfect after that? Take the good and look at yourself and stop this nonsense. Take a good look at yourself and stop this nonsense. Your ego is trying to trick you. Your ego is trying to trick you. You see, your ego does not want you to take a good look at yourself. It wants you to take a bad look at yourself. It wants you to identify with everything that you are not. It wants you to identify with the actions and feel guilty. With your actions and feel guilty. It wants you to judge, condemn, and blame yourself for not living up to the pictures and expectations of yourself and others. You must recognize that your ego is trying to trick you. This is not the truth about you. The way out of this is to affirm to your own to affirm to your own perfection that it's not your ego trip to affirm your own perfection. The way out of this is to affirm your own perfection. It's not your, an ego trip to affirm your own perfection. It's an ego trip not to affirm your own perfection. Remember the first and most essential step to changing your life, no matter what you want to be, do have, do or have, is to realize that you're your own perfection based upon truth about you. What you are spiritually whole, complete, is perfect. What you are is spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. You are perfect. Remember, the first and most essential step to changing your life is no matter what you want to be, do, or have, is to realize, to realize your own perfection based upon the truth about you. Neutralizing your ego. The way to neutralize your ego is to love yourself unconditionally. Loving yourself doesn't bloat your ego. Loving yourself actually neutralizes your ego because your ego isn't about loving yourself. 
We need to understand that life is consciousness. This means that we assume to be true will become real for us. Whatever we consciously, whatever we consciously are of, we will experience. In essence, we will experience in life what we are deeply convinced is so. This statement is important. We experience in life what we deeply, what we, what we're de deeply convinced is so. We experience in life what we're deeply convinced is so. If our thoughts patterns say, I cannot have this or that, I don't deserve this or that, I'm a bad person, and so on, we continue to create the conditions that correspond to our ideas of that evil, lack and limitation. The bottom line is this. If you cannot accept yourselves, then we are worthy and that we are deserving, that we cannot accept the other people, then we cannot accept the other people who are also worthy and deserving. We will therefore be judgmental of them all. The solution is to develop an unconditional love of ourselves and others. This is the only way that we can ever be free. We must take total acceptance of ourselves and first then others, knowing that as we can, as spiritual perfect, knowing that as we are spiritually perfect, so is everybody else. You have created yourself. In a very important way, you've created yourself, whether you realize it or not. All the character traits, mannerisms, ways of thinking, ways of walking, facial expressions, gestures, even the way of thinking and believing, you have borrowed, imitated, and made your own. It may have been from a parent or other family member, favorite teacher, friend, character in a book or a movie. Maybe you borrowed it from someone you didn't even know you liked. It may have been from someone who you made feel uncomfortable or afraid. Imitating that person could have been a way of making you feel less afraid and making the imitating and less afraid and a way of imitating others. Never reject yourself in any way. It's important to take a look at your personality and what, who you've created. Perhaps one of the reasons to keep yourself on doing this is because you've been an imitator. It's not uncommonly to get hung up on this. It may help to understand that nobody can create a self from scratch. Everybody has to do something. Something from everybody. Everybody chooses from what is available. Even though it's not built in personality through imitation, you're not a fraud. No one else has ever put together the exact same combination from which you have. Don't forget that there's only 12 notes in a musical scale. Again, there's only 12 notes in a whole musical scale. It's just how you line it up, and yet many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of unique and beautiful combinations are created. There's only 12 notes in a musical scale. It's all the matters of how they are put together. It doesn't make you any less a unique person to have taken away from others. The wonderful thing about this is that since you put it all together from scratch, you could change it in any way that you want. You're never stuck. It's not disaster. It's a discovery, and you're not the person that you thought you used to be. On the contrary, it's the beginning of an end of a disaster. In order to change your experiences you are causing that's given you pain and disharmony, it's necessary to begin to clear and understand and have understanding. Never help yourself by rejecting any part of yourself. We get into self-hatred because we set the picture up of how we think that we should be based on the conditioning from our family, peer groups, religion, society we live in. The sad part of this is that we'll never be able to live up to the pictures, expectations, models, standards, and concepts of how we think we should be. It's a psychological dead end. Freedom begins with self-acceptance. We're allowed our ego to trick us into believing that we're incompetent, inadequate, inadequate, insecure, stupid, bad, evil, unworthy. All of this can be summed up in poor self-esteem, poor self-image. Until we make conscious decisions to change our, change our own thought patterns, we will continue to have poor self-esteem, poor self-image. The first and most important thing in our life is self-acceptance, to love who you are, to be yourself. Only when you love yourself can you begin to love others. Many people say you should, f you should forget about yourself and just love others first. Well, it doesn't work that way. The truth is, is you must have first accept yourself with all your mistakes, all your so-called sins, all the times you look like a fool, all the times you've acted inappropriately. You must be able to stand before the entire world and make no excuse for yourself. When you can do that, then you're coming from a position of unconditional love. How you see yourself creates your behavior, and this behavior creates your environment of your results. When you have to attach your self-worth to the accomplishments of your behavior, you're setting yourself up for disappointments. No matter how hard you try, someone is going to think that you're not okay. Remember this. You're always, you'll always be a failure in someone else's eyes. Remember this. You're going to always be a failure to someone else's eyes. But you'll never win over everybody. Sometimes it's not the majority. Take a look at how things and how much in your life is winning approval and realizing this important truth that you'll never get the approval that you seek you'll never get the approval that you seek just do good and simply and you simply can't please everyone so learn to please yourself learn to please yourself and enjoy who you are holding your head up you can't fail as a person it's worth repeating that who you are is a spiritually perfect being 
but what you do is not always perfect. What you do may succeed or fail, but you can detach yourself from the results of remembering that you can never be a success or failure based on what you have done or what you do. There's no way that you can fail in life as a person. You're not set up that way. When you're hating yourself for all the things that you've done or haven't done, or into hating other people for what they haven't given you, then you're into the suffering. Suffering is a way of putting yourself down. It's a way of being angry with yourself. If you really get down to it, anger and suffering is a lack of happiness in the lives that comes from the disappointments in ourselves and not living up to some expectations that we have for ourselves and that other someone else and that other someone else has of us. In working with people who have self-destructive behaviors, I found that the majority cause of behavior is self-hatred. This self-hatred stems from a fact that they hadn't lived up to someone else's expectations. Most, most of us judge ourselves on the basis from what we have or don't have and what we've accomplished, what we haven't accomplished. We feel that when we are failures, we let others and ourselves down. When we don't come up with the expectations of our patterns, employers, expectations of our parents, employers, religious, religion, friend, mate, it concludes that we're no good. And this is known as self-judgment. When you're standing in judgment of yourself, you will just judge yourself. The truth is, it's true that each of us has this thing in our lives that we regret. But at some point, we have to stop dwelling on the regret and move on. We have to learn the lessons and throw away the experience. Learn the lessons and throw away the experience. You can never be for anyone as long as you are against yourself or ourselves. We can never be for anyone as long as we're against ourselves. To be against others is the highest is to be against ourselves. This is the spiritual and psychological truth. The most corrupt thing about what we can do is to judge someone. To suppress another individual, to take away another's aliveness is one of the most negative self-destructive behavior patterns a person can have. Release everyone, including yourself. What would happen if you had no regrets or you had no past? Try to imagine what would happen if you could totally forgive everyone and everything in your life regardless of whatever had they had done to you. Hopefully you're at the beginning to see the degree of what you cannot forgive. Hopefully you're at the beginning to see that to the degree that you cannot forgive, whether it is being yourself or someone else, you, perpetu you perpetuate unhappiness, poverty, sickness, and lack of limitations in your life. And lack and limitations in your life. Many people don't want to forgive others. They say little things like, why should I let them off the hook after what they did to me? The enemy... The enemy is always someone we think can harm us or take something away from us. But the truth is, is no one can harm us. People harm us through ourselves. Actually, they don't even harm us at all. We give them the in instructions of how to treat us, and then they just do what's following. Make a decision to give up all the resentment right now, because in the end, it will eventually destroy you. Yes, you say, I agree with you, but I don't know about any circumstances. They really did hurt me. Maybe I'll give up my resentment someday. But right now, I can't let go. Understand to do this mentally is more harmful and destructive to you than it is to the person that you're actually resenting. Turn your attention to this idea. You cannot be wealthy if you if you resent wealthy people. You cannot be successful if you resent successful people. You cannot be happy if you resent happy people. Whatever you resent is a statement of what you lack. This is also applies to the healing. You cannot be healed if you resent towards anyone because resentment breaks down the immune system and it literally can cause your own sickness. Resent can break down your immune system. Remember, whoever you resent is you. Remember, whomever you resent is you because we're all one. Rather than resent people who have done who have what you don't have or do what you cannot do, take the time to learn from these people. Let them become teachers. Let them become the masters. Be with the masters. Be with the people who know the life and how life works. Admire them. Acknowledge them. Support them. Having fun from what they have. And as you do that, you actually support yourself in having what you want. If you study philosophy and religion, you will see that the values and morals are principles, for they teach us often rooted is the belief of something that is better than something else. A is always better than B. Don't get caught up in that trap. Forget about what other individuals or group beliefs are as far as what they think is right. Whatever they think is right for you. Instead, realize you are connected to the same source of power and that you know what is best for you. Pleasing others is a psychological dead end. About 700 years ago, a great preacher, ripe with years and honors, lay dying. His students and disciples asked if he was afraid to die. Yes, he said, I'm afraid to meet my maker. How can that be? The students and disciples responded. You have lived such a life, an exemplary life, and led us to our own, led us out of the wilderness like Moses. You have judged between us wisely like Solomon. Softly replied, well, when I meet my maker, he will not ask, have you been like Moses or Solomon? He will ask, have you been yourself? And the story shows that throughout time, people have struggled to be themselves. 
why are we still struggling? The struggle comes out of the need to please others. By assuming your own destiny, you are bound to get somebody angry, for sure. Your boss, spouse, parents, children. At first, assuming your own destiny can be a lonely process, but if you, but it may seem that everyone is against you. But the only image that you must live up to is your own image. The opinion of those who you approve or disapprove are irrelevant. The decision to live your life is your own responsibility. The results of your own life and your own responsibility. All the results of your own life are your own responsibility. Your actions and actions become your own responsibility. Often other people have the values and beliefs that are in conflict of yours. And when they see you living in an opposition to their values and beliefs, it can be frightening, very frightening for them because in a way it threatens their foundation. When a person is confronted with your beliefs, there's an inner battle that's waged. And the battle is, could they possibly be right? If they are, that means I could be wrong. Could they possibly be right? Which means I could be wrong. A person who knows who they are is not threatened by the beliefs of others. Those who are insecure and do not know who they are will always be frightened by anyone who directly or indirectly threatens their belief system. But not if you know and really know who you are. How do you treat yourself? Let me ask you. Do you like yourself? Do you trust yourself? Do you keep promises that you make to yourself? Do you think that you're a good person? Are you yourself most of the time? Have you developed an act to cover up who you are? If you had a friend who treated you like you treat yourself or talked to you the way that you talk to yourself and broke commitments the way that you break commitments to yourself, do you think that you'd keep him as a friend? Let's face it, you probably wouldn't want that type of person around. It's very important to take a look at the way that we treat others. Most of the time, we are on our own, we are our own worst enemy. We are afraid to meet in inner selves because we think that we may not even like what we see. We often hear people say, I want to explore myself or I'm I'm afraid of what it's going to find out about myself or I'm afraid of strange creatures that I might find along the way of this along this journey understand this clearly it is an absolute impossible for the truth about yourself to cause fear again it is absolutely impossible for the truth about yourself to cause fear no matter how terrible the truth may be it is powerless in itself to either frighten or harm you fear is caused by resistance to the truth and the misunderstanding of it. Again, fear is only caused by the resistance of the truth and the misunderstanding of it. Start the journey of self-discovery. Start your journey of self-discovery at once. At once. Nothing but good can come from it. The understanding of the fear cures fear. Don't get hung up on the kind of person that you think that you are. Don't concern yourself with whether or not it's better or worse or other people. Instead, try to know yourself as the kind of person that you are and the kind of person you would like to be. If you would like to be a hand-finished, if you look at a hand-finished house, it is under construction, you don't condemn it for its unfinished condition. You don't say it's inferior to the other houses, nor you concerned with its appearance. All you do realize is that, for additional work, adopt this way of thinking towards yourself. It just needs additional work, looking at the house. Whatever you present condition, you just realize the need more for of a construction. Be patient with yourself, but be firm towards the necessary work that needs to be done. Self-worth comes from self. Self. That's why it's not called other worth. If your worth comes from others, you will never be able to love yourself. When you're, when you're an expert on yourself, you are an expert on everyone else. When you're an expert on yourself, you're an expert on everyone else. A conscious person knows himself. You know his own nature, and therefore I know everything about other people who have the same nature. Know yourself as you are, and you will know others as they are. Never be afraid to expose a weakness in yourself. Exposing a weakness is the beginning of a strength. Remember, everything you learn about yourself is good news. No matter how difficult or surprising or it's surprising it may be, it's good news. No matter what you ever hear about yourself for the rest of your life, it's good news. With the belief that you know that you must abandon but be reluctant to do so as well. Wise person will always be willing to give up a piece of coal in exchange for a diamond. Have the courage to do this and self-change begins. You don't have to have permission from others to change your life. Don't ask. It is the right for me to go against everything that I have been taught to believe. Instead, I'd say, let me see how my intensity I can put into my own search. How your own desires for personal freedom is the only search warrant, warrant that you'll ever need. Take a look at what you're denying yourself. Take a look at what you're denying yourself. If you're really going to learn the truth about yourself and live the life the way you're capable of living, a lot of people aren't going to like it because they're not 
committed to the same path that you are? Are you going to deny yourself riches because others are poor? Are you going to deny yourself health because millions of people, millions of people are sick? Take a good look at what you're denying yourself. And don't ever think of yourself as wrong or wanting what you want. And don't ever think, you're think, think of yourself as wrong for wanting what you want. As we move along the path of self-discovery, we bound to make mistakes. Those so-called mistakes, faults, sins, errors are not you. Make sure that you separate who you are from what you have and what you do. Again, separate who you are from what you have and what you do. You, that's what's happening in your life is only temporary and it will always be changing. It's important to understand that your higher self is changeless. When you identify with your temporary nature, it takes it takes on a belief that what you have and what you do is the real you. It's possible that the biggest error that you can make in life, it's possible the biggest error that you can ever make in life when your higher self is changeless. When you identify with your temporary nature and you take on belief that what you have and what you do is the real you. What you have and what you do is not the real you. To experience your own magnificence, it requires that you separate what you have and what you do from who you are. Who you are. Learn to separate the performances from the performer. Become the involved. Become the involved in what's happening in your life, but not to uh, identify with the temporary nature. As you stand on the seashore and you watch the ships sail by, there is no problem as long as you simply stand there and watch them go by. It's only when you identify with the ships that you feel pain and suffering. If you say, that's my ship, then you will grieve when it passes from the sight. If you say, I must command that ship, then you will live in a fear that someone else will become its captain. Likewise, it's simply watching and observing our mistakes and unworkable behaviors without judgment. We prevent harmful identification with our temporary mistakes, faults, and errors. The only authority figure is within yourself. The only authority figure is within yourself. As you start a question and look honestly in your life and you come to a point where you begin to realize that the only authority figure is within yourself. We look to others for authority to tell us what we're supposed to do, but the only person who will ever know what to do is ourselves. Have you ever wondered why certain people are connected by a con artist? A con artist cannot con someone who is conscious. People have trouble understanding why others take advantage of them. The reason they get taken advantage of is because they give the power away. They don't want to be responsible for their own lives. They don't want to make their own decisions so they allow others to do it for them. But understand this, the truth. If you allow others to do it for you, they'll do it to you. And as long as you let others have responsibility for your life, they will control your destiny. Why do you want to change your world? Why do you want to change your world? It's easy to say that others are to blame, but this type of thinking puts us farther into a bondage because it sets our limits of freedom. Once again, straightening up and thinking involves separating what we have and what we do from who we are inside. Separate what we have and what we do from who we are inside from who we are inside, separating the doer from the deed. The secret is to live in this world, but not to let the world live in us. We want our boat in the water, but we don't want the water in our boat. When the water is in the boat, we start to sink, but when we bail it out, then we have to bail it out like crazy to stay afloat. The problem is, is we often find ourselves drowning in the water of physical effects that we've created in our lives. Once, our, once we're drowning, we don't know any other way to deal with it except to fight it and to try to change our circumstances. Before I go any farther, let me ask you this. Why do you want to change your world? Every time we attempt to change our world or change whatever's going on around us, whatever it be in our business, careers, government, members of our family or mate or whatever, we're operating under the illusion that these people or events are doing something to us. Actually, what we need to do is change our experience and the relations to them. People and events never do anything to us. They merely trigger feelings that are already within us. If we go back to the basic principle of life, we understand that nothing happens in this world that we don't permit deep within our own consciousness. It's been said that many ways that it is done within and unto you as you believe. It's done unto you as you believe, and sometimes those beliefs are very deep. Whatever is going on within our hearts, it is fundamental alignment with our outside, with our outside experiences. Even... Even we may not be consciously aware of it. I know the principle is difficult to accept because there are undoubtedly things in our lives that we consciously do not want. However, the truth of the matter is there's deep inner need that you are satisfying. There's a deep inner need that you are satisfying. Imagine the unhappy person sitting on the home stating, I want to change my life. This person 
redecorates his house and he finds himself just as unhappy as he was before. So he redecorates it several more times and he feels no change in himself. Do you know any people who believe that they can change the level of happiness that they have by changing their exterior scenario or scenery? There have been made a mistake. They definitely made a mistake. Where can you correct that? Where, where can they correct themselves? If you like to be totally honest with yourself and take a good look at what's going on in your life, you'll discover that it's actually happening. Therefore, it stands in reasons that if we attempt and we are successful in changing the outer effect, but don't change the inner causation, we will only create the same experience again. It's all about the inner causation. If you no longer know what to do, this process of self-evaluation is very good paths of finding yourself. It'll help you to understand that the mechanical thinking process cannot rise above the limited level. If you do not know and you're not sure what to do, or if you have any anxiety, don't try to seek release it from don't try to seek release from the anxiety. Just stay where you are and let it tell you something extraordinary. And it will. The truth about you is that you're not what you have, and you're not what you do. You are spiritually whole, complete and perfect, and your success and happiness in life will be in direct proportion to your ability to accept this truth about yourself, that you're spiritually whole. Chapter 3. What are you telling yourself? It is a demonstrated fact of life that you and I do not behave in accordance with the reality of what we can do, but in accordance with the reality of what we believe we can do. It stands no reason if we change the way that we believe, we could change the way we act. How do we get our belief system? Human beings record what they are thinking about. As infants, our thoughts were emotions, and so we recorded emotion. Then we began to put pictures with emotion. Then we labeled those pictures with words. As adults, we now think as one or all of three-dimensional forms, usually in the form of words first. This is reference to a self-talk. Self-talk is a process from which words trigger pictures that bring about emotions. Every emotional thought, it leaves the record in the neuron cell structure of the brain. We do not record what is happening, rather than we record what we think is happening. It is the record of the interpretation that begins the shape of our personality. A prime example of how this works can be seen in children from the same family group and develop different personalities and lifestyles. It is not from what happened to them as children that it was recorded, but what they perceived what was happening. It was their interpretations that formed the different personalities and attitudes, even though they came from the same family background. One thought alone does not form our self-image. It takes an accumulation of experiences and thoughts to build our self-image. The key to freedom is to control what we think and our perceptions of reality as we think it. Other people can hand us opinions of, them, of ourselves, but those are their opinions, and they can tell us how great we are, and, or they can put us down. That information is not recorded and does not become part of our own belief system until we accept it with our own thoughts. If we ourselves are beliefs in ourselves in a certain way, we will act in accordance with that same belief, whether it's true or not true. Letting go is not easy. Whether we want to get a strong belief, whether we want to get a strong belief, whether we think that what we know is the truth, what we lock into our beliefs as a self-defense mechanism conflicting beliefs. We cannot hold conflicting beliefs in our mind without anxiety and distress. So, what we do rather, what we do is gather supportive data and information to prove that we are right and not crazy for believing what we believe. This can work against us, against us in seeking out our own truth because we operate in accordance with the truth as we see it, not as it really, really is. Sometimes we hold on to opinions, attitudes, and beliefs that no longer serve us. This way we must examine our beliefs on our regular basis to see what we might be lying to ourselves or blocking our information that might be more relevant. We don't, why don't we, why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why lock our truth because we don't want to be wrong or make a mistake or feel bad? It starts with self-talk. Self-talk is the constant con conversations that we carry on with ourselves as we perceive what we think, see, and hear. It is a three-dimensional form of thought from which makes the words, pictures, and emotions. We build and modify our self-image with our self-talk using words, triggers, pictures that evoke a feeling and an emotion. Our self-image is an accumulation of all the thoughts, attitudes, and opinions that we perceived and stored about ourselves since childhood. It is a subconscious picture from which we are recorded over the many years. These pictures control how we think and how we perform. Once we vividly imagine and experience it as recorded in our subconscious, we are stuck with it until it makes a conscious choice to displace it. If you choose to make a changes with your self-image, you can use the self-talk and visualization to create a new picture from which will enact and changes and change your desires. And change you desire. All meaningful and lasting changes start first in our mind and our imagination, and then it works in our outward into the reality. 
Every statement you make has an effect on your subconscious mind, so it's important to be very careful about what you say about yourself. Remember that other people can hand you their opinions about you, but what you think about yourself and about you is what determines your self-image. Your subconscious doesn't know the difference. The impact of building a positive or a negative self-image is powerful because the self-image is stored in the unconscious of as a reality. The self-image is, is, is stored inside of the subconscious as reality. Our subconscious beliefs, the information is stores are true, whether the true is truth is not, whether it's true or not. If someone calls you stupid, it makes an original recording from recording on your subconscious. Every time you replay the experience of being called stupid, as far as your subconscious is concerned, it is happening all over again because the subconscious does not recognize the difference between real or imagined experience. Each time we replay the same thought, it gets recorded to reality over and over and reinforces in a dominant belief. In this case, I am stupid and these values and these thoughts accumulate. They bring about patterns of belief and they allow these thoughts to build up in our minds. And if we allow these thoughts to build up in our minds, we then act out those beliefs. Thus we live in a self-fulfilling prophecy. Thus we live in a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure enough, principle. Our level of ex expectation. Our level of expectation, whether it is ourselves, another person, a day, a task, a situation, determines our outcome. Once we lock into the per then once we lock into the preconceived notion of how we think things are going to be worked out, then we go on to create the situation and gather information to make the reality, and sure enough, we get exactly what we expected. This is called the sure enough principle. Sure enough principle. You can use this as self-talk either reinforces already existing self-images or beliefs, or it can be used to modify a better or worse and worse opinions and attitudes that you have about yourself. The sure enough principle. Again, Our level of expectation, whether it's ourselves, another person, a day, a task, situation, determines our outcome. Once we lock onto a preconceived notion of how we think things are going to work out, we then go out and create that situation or gather information to make the reality a sure enough. And we call, and sure enough, we get what we expect. This is called the sure enough principle. It's when we put all the laws of attractions to absolutely have that happen, and it does. That's the sure enough principle. Self-reinforcement, self-reinforcing cycle. The self-reinforcing cycle. My self-image controls how I perform or my performance reality. I always act like I like myself. I cannot act otherwise. I could try to act otherwise, but I will have to work very hard to override my subconscious picture of reality. I automatically behave like this, like the me. The me who is controlled by my picture. What forms the picture in the first place was my self-talk. Each time I affirm that I am a certain way, I record it in my images of reality. I act accordingly to the images of reality automatically, without even thinking about it. And after I act, and after, after I act like I thought I was supposed to, I talk to myself about it, and I continue to tell myself the self-talk. What I did to say to my, what did I say to myself? That's the way I am. Which reinforces the pictures that I say. Always act this way. Which reaffirms the image. Which turns ensures I will do the same thing the next time. This is known as self-reinforcing cycles. The self-reinforcing cycle works like this. Number one, I notice my performance of a task, how I act, and how others evaluate my actions. I notice my performance of a task, how I act and how others evaluate my actions. Number two, I talk to myself about my performances through self-talk and affirmation statements. Number three, my self-talk reinforces other positive and negative self-images or how I feel about myself to reinforce my self-talk. Number four, how I feel about myself forms a self-image which is a regulating mechanism that allows how I perform the next time. How I feel about myself creates a self-image which is regulating mechanisms that controls how I perform the next time. Most people, after they have performed below their level of expectations or if they've anticipated poor performance in their imaginations, reinforce a negative experience with statements such as, there I go again, or that's just like me, or that's the way I am, or it happens every time, or this isn't going to be one of those days, or, this is going to be one of those days, etc. Whenever you behave, whenever, you're, whenever your behavior doesn't match your self-image, you will say to yourself, that's not the way I am. That's not like me. These statements will only ensure continuing poor performance by reinforcing the poor self-image. The only choice you have is to live up to your picture. How to increase your performance. How to increase your performance. We have to learn to cease attacking our self-images with those times from which our performances does not live up to the expectations because our negative self-talk will only increase poor performance. So, how do we correct this? The first thing we need to say to ourselves when we're engaged in negative self-talk is stop it. And then follow up with a statement which is not like me. The next phrase is key phrase. Say to yourself, the next time I will 
keep positive on this subject. I will not blow up. Then make an affirmation of how you are going to do this next time. Shut up the old picture. Shut off the negative movements. Don't tolerate poor performances from yourself or others. Don't put yourself or others down by focusing on what you're doing wrong. Just say, well, the next time I will do it this way. If you are working with others, you could say, well, the next time I want you to approach the client this way. Or the next time we'll do it like this. What you're doing with these statements is giving a positive, immediate feedback to your subconscious. Instead of recording the negative picture, you trigger the picture of performance of the performance that you want. The key to reinforcing your already existing positive self-image is modifying your self-image for the better. Is to visualize what you want in your performance, to look like what you want it to look next time, and stop picturing, thinking about it, and talking about what you are trying to avoid. When your performance pleases you and you feel good about it, you should use positive self-talk to reinforce the positive picture. Affirm it to yourself that that's the way I am, that's like me. Positive self-talk statements are the best way to maintain and build your own self-esteem. They deliberately cancel out the negative put-downs we apply to ourselves or the opinions other people try to make us accept about ourselves. How do you feel about yourself? The size and scope of your goals will increase proportionately with your self-esteem. When you have low self-esteem, you will attract negative influences which will prevent you from reaching your goals. Take a look at the clients you are dealing with on the relationships from which you are involved. The fact is that you will always associate people that you feel worthy of being with. This includes your friends as well as your clients and or your business. Take a look at your material possessions. You draw from yourself which you feel are worthy receivings. The car you drive, the clothes you wear, the home you live in, the total quantity, quality of your life is determined by your self-esteem and self-worth. The kind of labels that you are putting on yourself, each one of us has dozens, perhaps hundreds of labels that we've given ourselves during the lifetimes. I'm a good manager, I'm assertive, I'm shy, warm, friendly, stupid, short-tempered, had easy or hard to get along with, lazy or poor. Because we act with labels, and because we sometimes labels are helpful, but in order to grow and develop, some of these labels need to be changed. Again, we must be careful about how we talk to ourselves. The problem is that whatever self-image we accepted puts a ceiling on the use of our potential. Any self-talk sometimes could put a ceiling on our potential. The ceiling has no relationship to our ability to use that potential, but we can only act in performance like the person we see ourselves to be. We must deliberately take control of our self-talk. It'll control us, the opinions of our labels, we also of our... the opinions or labels that we have of ourselves cannot be totally erased because they are stored in our subconscious memory but they can be displayed through self-talk the new positive messages will then become our dominant opinion and will always act in accordance with our dominant opinions and beliefs the most important reason for changing our image is when you are dissatisfied with your performances in a particular area that is of our self-images or controls or our performance, our behavior is automatic. Until we change the picture that we have of ourselves, we will automatically continue to reenact the same performance. Our same image regulates the use of our potential. Our self-image regulates the use of our potential. Anytime we move away from our self-imagery, anxiety, tension will set in because we are constantly working to act like the self we perceive ourselves to be. Our self-image is what we believe we are capable of doing right now. That's our self-image. Increasing your expectancy level. Increasing your expectancy level. When we find ourselves being forced by our own intent, by the situations around us, out of where we feel comfortable, away from where we know we subconsciously belong, anxiety and tensions sets in. We not only have internal comfort zones, expectancy levels that concerns with kinds of behavior that expects us and expects from us, but we have also been programmed as to the kind of environment from which we belong. We have to example the subconscious pictures of the kind of car that we should be driving, the income that we deserve, the restaurants we feel comfortable in, situations that we feel comfortable in, etc. It's important for us to be aware of whenever we find ourselves straying from the picture and the negative tensions reminds us to get back where you belong. Get back where you belong is forcing us to return to the environment from which we subconsciously know we belong in. As you can see in the responses that makes a change difficult or slow at best. Every time we find ourselves in an unfamiliar environment, job or social situation, we will come up with the logical reasons why we should not participate, why it won't work, why we should stay away or stay the way that we are. The problem is, is we didn't deliberately program the kind of environment in which we feel was comfortable. Our subconscious just absorbed through observation where we think we should be. The key to change is the ability to visualize ourselves in a different situation, environment, car, job, relationship, or career. Identify with your goal. Only vivid imagery is the first person and in the present range changes of reality. This will be discussed throughout the chapter 6. Program your mind at best, but for now it is necessary only to understand that visualization is not like watching a movie. Only images appear experienced and identified 
with in the first person presents tense. Change realities. Chapter 6, program your mind for the best, but for now, it is necessary only to understand the visualization is not like watching a movie. Only images experienced and identified within the first person, present tense, change the reality. Images that are in your present tense can change a reality. If we can't identify with the image, we can't have it because it doesn't register on the subconscious level. If I don't identify with that, then I'm not visualizing it. I'm left with the impression that other people can be, have, or do this, but not me. It's okay for them, but I don't think I could ever do it. You must see yourself in your pictures. Deliberate affirmations of self-talk, combined with visualization, produces the end result. As we continue to do over and over what we do, pretty soon our subconscious accepts it is true for us. In the beginning, there was... There will be conflict between where you are or what you have and what you are accepting subconsciously. One of the primary functions of the subconscious, however, is to resolve conflicts between the way we are thinking about what we are thinking about and what we are experiencing in our reality. And because our subconscious is creative, it will begin to create what we are thinking about and what we are visualizing. The real key here is not only to... Be different from your picture. Modify the picture first. Real growth and the change begins from the inside out. We must change the picture in our mind. As we do this, our comfort zone will expand automatically. This becomes our new truth. We then act in accordance with our new truth and belief. We live a self-fulfilling prophecy. How do you know what your self-image is? Take a look at your actions, your behavior, and your performance. Also ask yourself, what do I expect of me? Where do I feel out of, why, where do I feel out of place? If you see yourself as poor, you will unconsciously do things that make yourself lose. When you lose, you do, what do you suppose you, you say to yourself? Oh, that's the way I am, or I always lose that, or I never have any money. This reinforces the picture, which causes you to fail again, which causes your self-talk, which reinforces the picture, and so it continues. People without money feel victimized, but what they don't really understand is that they live in a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. It has nothing to do with the money. People with winning, people with winning self-images cause themselves to do things that win. If they lose occasionally, they don't accept that as their fate. They know that losing is not normal for them. They reject it by saying, well, that's not like me normally. Well, that's not the way things happen for me. Or the next time, I'll change this. Attitudes help and hinder our success. Attitudes help or hinder our success. Attitudes are extremely important in determining the difference between success and failure. What are attitudes? Attitudes are dominant beliefs. Dominant beliefs in and themselves. Attitudes are neither positive nor negative. The valuation of attitude is always in relation to our goal. Once we set a goal and our attitude either supports us or keeps us from attaining the goal. For example, being an introvert in itself is neutral. However, your goal is to be a public speaker. Such an attitude wouldn't support you in obtaining your goal. The attitude ha you have developed to cause us to seek out is to avoid situations. We picked up the most of our attitudes within deliberate intents. We picked up most of our attitudes without deliberate intent. Most of them were formed unconsciously. On the other hand, if we have attitudes we can cause to avoid situations, we have a conscious decision to change them. All we need to do is make a first a new affirmation, visualizing an end result. What we choose to have and have a response and repicture ourselves to being a person who has an emotional response you can visualize yourself seeking out or in some cases avoiding if you choose a particular action in any daily life attitudes allow us to grow or prevent us from growing depending on how we use them attitudes allow us to grow or prevent us from growing depending on how we use them the primary function of the subconscious the subconscious is a system of checks and balances it always makes sure that the image of reality is coming true. It always makes sure that the image of your reality is coming true. The image of reality comes true. It works to keep us from going insane because our subconscious mind works in habits of thought regardless of whether we're, it's good for us or not. We need to begin to evaluate whether or not we're operating on valid information. It's, enforce, it's, infor, it's information appropriate for our goals today. Is it appropriate for where we choose to be at this time? In dealing with the world around us, our actions are based on the habits of thought, accepting by our subconscious. We need to examine our habits and thought to see if they aren't relevant for our success, and which are further ones we program towards our goals and which we do not program towards our goals. 
we will either stay where we are or through our own deliberate intent convince ourselves that it's our best interest to change. If we choose to change, we must visualize ourselves into the new belief. Constructive self-talk and imagery takes the ceiling off of the use of the preconceived abilities and allows us to grow in a controlled manner without stress, tension, or negative feedback. It's good to understand and it's good to be understood that we have an overall self-image as well as a specific self-image for specific areas of our lives. Each self-image is formed in the same manner. The job of a subconscious is to creatively ensure that I am always acting in accordance with the truth as I see it, to act in accordance with the truth as I see it. My performance. However, I act and behave in control of my self-image. Again, my performance, however, how I act is in, or behave is controlled by my self-image. Change self-talk before changing your actions. Instead of working on your actions, we want to work on our self-imagery. We, How do we go about doing that? The same way we do the self-images established in the first place is self-talk. Through your self-talk. Work on self-talk begins in any given area from which you choose. You start to control our self-talk from when our behavior is other than from which we want it to be. We will say to ourselves in some manner, that's not the way I am, or that's not like me, and make an affirmation to say, me? Me is like. It's like me because I'm a winner. It's like me to be a winner. It's not like me to be loving. It's like me to be loving. It is like me to be loving. It's like me to be successful. It's like me to be outgoing. It's like me. It's like me. Yeah, it's like me. When I do something that is successful, something that is in the past would not have liked me. Someone would not have liked me. I must then, through my self-talk, reinforce my belief by saying, well, that's the way I am. That's like the new me. I am successful, easy to get along with, and outgoing, etc. And as I do that, the subconscious mind records all of my self-talk. It does not record what is happening. It just records the opinion of what is happening. What I image is to be true is actually what's going to be recorded. Everything you say in your self-talk is going to be recorded to your subconscious recorder. We move towards what we picture. We move towards what we picture, we physically, emotionally, psychologically create our activity and movement, what we hold as our pictures and the pictures in our minds, whether it's good for us or not. As long as we hold the picture or is drawn towards that picture, we cannot, we control our imagery through self-directed and through direct self-talk. We can image ourselves into a new behavior. Even right now, we may be opposite to the way we're behaving or acting. Remember though, we must come... Remember, thought must come before action. Thought must come before action. Don't be concerned about the actions. Only be concerned about your self-talk and mental pictures. Make sure that they are controlled to bring about the desired end result. As the pictures changes, so will your performance. Our subconscious creative mechanisms knows exactly what we are, that we are in a time and space in relationships to the target. The relationship is where it is right now, and the end result is us from which we're trying to achieve, the end result. If we get off course, negative feedback will motivate us to stay on course. This stimulates the creative energy to drive to attract people, material things, new books, seminars, whatever else we need to create a picture in our mind, for that picture must come first. We can't start without a picture. This subconscious creative mechanism provides for us a useful and powerful technique for utilizing our creative abilities. To utilizing our creative abilities. Because we move towards the pictures from which we see. It is important to control what we are picturing. The goal must be clearly and specifically defined. What are we after? What does it look like? If we cannot describe it, you cannot get it. Forcing change creates failure. Once the biggest traps we fall into the forcing change, such as trying to discipline ourselves or saying to ourselves, I have to do this or I have to lose weight, I have to work harder, this very push is the subconscious working against the end result. In time, you'll tell yourself that you have to do something at the job of your subconscious saying, no, you don't. You don't have to do anything. I'll get you out of it. With creative avoidance, procrastination is in any way possible. You'll find a way to do it. When you say, I have to, I have to, say I have to 50 times. If you say, I have to, you are saying, I have to. But if I had my own way, I would rather be doing something else. Uh, the harder you try to do something, the more you work against your natural subconscious creative mechanism. When I recognize I can choose to or want to change because it was my idea to become like that, then I have the power around me and the most people have chosen to give up. Once I recognize I am a self-made person, both in success and failure, and this success or failure is mine to control, I will stop saying I have to, and instead, no more I have tos. Instead, I'm going to say, I choose to, choose, 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 choose to. I choose to. I can be my image. I can be my image, and it tells me that I can, and I can move constructively towards the end result with excitement, magnetic en energy, and drive. Remember, your word is law. 
When you can rely on the promises to yourself, to others, you become a powerful person. We are only as strong as our word is strong. And if you give your word to the others, that you give your word to others, it's going to be some place in a particular time. It will call to a particular time. It'll make this or that change. You must be able to follow through because every time you don't keep your word, you lose your power. It is not only what your word is to others because you can make excuses, it is also the word that you give to yourself. When you say that you intend to do something, then you give yourself the word to keep your agreements with yourself. When you know you can count on yourself with that power of filling that belief, that's not much you cannot, there's, there's not much that you cannot do because you know you make things happen. It is simply a matter of keeping our minds off what we don't want and on what we do want. Don't spend time imaging and imprinting what you are trying to avoid. Instead, just keep Instead of going away from something you don't want, go towards what you do want. Go towards what you do want. I have always been a way. I have always been this way. This is the way I behave. This is the way I am. I have always been this way. This is the way I am. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way things always happen to me. The best advice I can share with you is to never go by past track records. Never go by the past. Every moment is a brand new beginning. Now, what do you really want? Successful high performance people look at what they have and what they want and move towards the end results. So what is it that I want? We must decide for ourselves. What makes us happy? What makes us a happy person? What do I get? Why do I go to work? Why do I go to school? Why am I involved with anything? Why do I, what do I want for myself? What everyone wants in life is to feel good. It's as simple as that. It's the feeling that we are after. The feeling of feeling good. Or the feeling of happiness. We tend to go after things that we get that feeling from. The material things or even things, excuses to play the game. Whatever it is that turns you on. But what do I enjoy? What is it that I enjoy? This is the key or the question. Once I know that... And the answer is going to be a different for every single person. But reaching that goal is very, very easy. When we are on purpose doing what we love, we will draw to the people and circumstances that we need to accomplish our goal and purpose. When you are consciously using the tools of self-talk imagery, you deliberately throw your system out of order. Understand that you will be driven strongly among, amongst obsessively into whatever you are affirming, affirming and imaging. And if you only use the concepts in one area of your life, you will become obsessive about that. Setting goals with equal proportional balance is the key so that you do not set, so that you do not steal from one part of your life to fulfill another. Start by knowing where you want to go and begin to talk to yourself about it. Self-talk combined with constructive imagery are the powerful tools that you can go from where you are right now to, to where you want to be. Chapter 4. Believing is Seeing. In this chapter, I want to give you some tools for becoming a powerful goal setter. The concepts and ideas in this section may change the way you approach your whole life from now on. There's a general belief in the commonly accepted in this culture that the belief is that seeing is believing. In essence, we must be realistic. If I can see it, then I'll believe it. We have already learned that human beings have not in the accordance with the truth, but the accordance with the perception of the truth. We have already learned that human be beings believe not in accordance with the truth, but in accordance with their perception of the truth. Perception of the reality limits success. Your perception of the reality will limit your success. People who must see it before they can believe it, you must have concrete feedback before they will take a risk, find it, in every diff find it very difficult to grow or to change. Most of their lives they spend waiting for something to happen rather than making something happen. We stimulate our creative energy and drive in direct proportion to our ability to use our imagination. However, use our imagination, it's limited to our perception of reality. All of us have some natural limitations in perceiving reality, but we can expand our awareness of this reality. We are not limited to the un... We are not limited by it unless we choose to be limited. In order to change this, we must be willing to take a good look and see if our perception of reality is perhaps limited or, dis or distorted. No two people have the same awareness or perception of reality. This accounts for the uniqueness of each individual. Although we perceive the same world or interpret what we are seeing, we interpret what we are seeing differently. To the degree of our own awareness, perception is, perception is limited. Our habits, our thoughts, and actions will also be limited. Our awareness is simply a combination of all these experiences, expressions, attitudes that we've accumulated since birth. Our awareness can be summed up in a total life experience. Our awareness determines our clarity from which we perceive and understand everything that affects our life. Everything that happens in our life is filtered through our own awareness, our awareness. We then act in accordance with our present level of the awareness or we don't. If our awareness is faulty, then our actions will be faulty. So isn't it how you get into, isn't that how you get into trouble? It's what we think we know that is not really so. 
Every decision we make and every action we take is based on our level of awareness or at any given moment, our level of awareness. In order to be all we can be, we must constantly work to change and expand our level of awareness or our perception of reality. Once we determine what we want, the information will start to flow through. Remember that because we cannot see it, it does not mean that it does not exist. It only means that we are blocking out information that is not important to us at the moment. Again, we're blocking out the information. We need to accept all the information so we can be on the right information. This blocking is natural and simply a protective mechanism to keep us from going insane. Unchecked, however, the mechanism can limit our possibilities. There is, at any given time, a vast amount of information available to support you in creating whatever it is that you desire. However, most people and groups and people and businesses fall into this category, try to solve problems without first determining exactly what it is that they wish to accomplish. They make decisions based on available facts and resources that they have at the present moment. The natural response is, is we can't do that. We don't know where the money is coming from or Who's going to help us, or we don't have anything, or we, we don't have what we need, or we don't have what it takes. We don't have enough experience with this. Focusing on the end result. What I want to share with you is this. What I want to share with you is this. You don't need to know all of the answers. In fact, if you did have all the answers to all those questions, the information, and the information, the information would, in the present moment, probably work against you. What you do need to know is this, is what is the end result? Where do I want to end up? What do I want to create? Set a goal first and whatever is necessary as far as the information will get you through. Having all the information first without the goal only confuses the mind and it works against you. Remember this, information does not come through first. Information does not come through first. Before the information can even be filtered through, your brain mind mechanism must lock onto the goal or an end result. Once this is said, everything you need is to know to accomplish the end result will present itself to you. Unless something has personal value or threatens our security, we will not be conscious of the information that we need. In order to be conscious of this information, we must have the first goal. High performance people, high performance people that get things done know this secret. Believing is seeing. Everybody else wants to have the facts first and then they'll believe. But it doesn't work that way. You must believe in the goal first and then you will see how you do it. And then you will see how to do it because the necessary information will get through. You must determine what is of value to you. What is of a value to you? What kind of client do you want? What kind of home do you want? What kind of knowledge do you want before it gets through? You find what you are looking for? You find what you're looking for. Here's an example of how it works. Suppose that you are interested in a particular brand of automobile, perhaps considering buying one. If you just bought one, notice that as soon as you decide what you want, this makes you see this car everywhere. There seems to be a passing one every few miles. Why is it because your particular brand of car now it's a value to you? This example would be applied to the goals of finding clients, jobs, business, or people from whom you'd like to be involved. As soon as you know what you are looking for, the opportunities and information will become apparent. And if you do not know what you are looking for, then you won't find it, even if it passes through your life every single day. This also applies to your clients and customers. Knowing exactly what your customers or clients want will increase your awareness of how to help them obtain it. If you don't know exactly what they want, the information on how to help them will not get through. If you want to be good conversationalist, if you want to be a good conversationalist, you had better say something of value to the other person before you can even get through. Otherwise, they'll just filter you out or block you out in the conversation. We can only pay attention to what is of a value to us. Thinking outside our limitations. Another person we don't see opportunities is that we limit ourselves by the way we think. If we're willing to think outside of our limitations, we must be willing to think outside of our limitations. We often feel unforgettable or uncomfortable psychologically when we experience contradictions or conflicting opinions, beliefs or attitudes all at the same time. It is possible to hold on to different attitudes without it being emotional, emotional disharmony only as long as the situation does not occur in which these attitudes are brought into direct confrontation. Generally, when people are placed into a new and unfamiliar environment and situation, a change of behavior and or modification of an attitude is necessary to lessen or eliminate the anxiety caused by the change. We are always seeking to maintain psychological balance by attempting to get things to fit together inside of ourselves. The most common way to relieve conflicts is through rationalization. Rationalization is what people use when they attempt to explain their logic or reasons for their actions, opinions, or conducts. Rationalization. In order for a person not to look foolish or make embarrassing mistakes, he will gather people and information that supports his opinion to justify his conduct. As example, when we meet a person of the opposite sex that we are attracted to, particularly trait in that person, the tendency is to subconsciously see the other good features and block out the negative traits. This justifies our 
reason to have a relationship with that person. Before a person makes a, or communicates or a decision, he will usually go through a stage where he's evaluating the overall situation. During this time, this person will usually be open to a new information. However, once he makes a decision or a commitment, he will start to gather only people in the facts to make him look good or make him right for believing and acting the way that he does. Start looking for reasons that you can get away with. The process is called clustering. Clustering. Unfortunately, when we seek to prove that we are right from being the way that we are, choosing what we choose to do, we block out the information from which may be useful to us by making rational decisions, essentially blinding ourselves to other options. When we lock into an idea or reason as to why something won't work, the solution does not get through. Don't think about why it doesn't work. Try to find a why how it could work and the solution will get through. Solutions instead of problems. You don't look for problems or talk about them. You're talking strictly solutions. Because we can't see a solution, it doesn't mean that it does, it's not there. If you can tell yourself that there's no way to expand your business, no way to come to complete this or that project, no way to get something done or get what you want, you focus on the problem instead of the solution. You can use your subconscious to help you gain answers and solutions, or you can use the same subconscious to come up with reasons and rationaliz rationalizations of why it can't be done. The choice is always there, and the choice is always yours. For an example of this, when you want to buy something, most people shop around for the lowest price. Once you found the item they want, they usually try to come up with a creative way to cut back on expenses and do with something, something else to find, do something else from which they could find to afford it. But what they don't realize is that they could use the same creative energy to figure out ways to keep what they have and earn more money to buy what they want. In other words, they can use the same creative energy to, to move backwards or forwards. When fear sets in, we are very easily rationalized. Why should we retreat, give up, cut back, or why we can't do something? We are using our energies trying to figure out what things aren't available to you and can't happen for you, and or you putting your energy into how you can make this happen, how you, how you can make this happen. We attract what we feel worthy of. Another reason that we see problems and failures instead of solutions or opportunities is because we do not feel worthy of being, doing, or having the things that we truly desire. The problem is that we can only attract from which we feel worthy of. The greater your feelings of self-worth, the higher the value you have of yourself. The more options you have and the more risks you can take. The better you think of yourself, the more others will want to be a part of your life. They will want to be a part of you as a, either a client or a customer or a friend. A person with a strong sense of self-worth says, I can handle anything. I don't know how to handle it yet, but I do know that I can handle anything. I didn't need to know how to do this until now, but now I know I need to know, I need to know how to do it. Now that it's here, the information will come through. Everything then becomes an opportunity to learn and to do more. Allowing others to be our teachers. Sometimes the information that we need comes through other people. If you could come in front of a suggestion or even just criticism, However, if we have a poor self-esteem, self-worth, they will not be able to accept the suggestions or handle the criticism from others. Our response will be defensiveness, such as, why should I listen to my subordinates, or why should I listen to my children, or why can, what can they possibly know that I don't know? What should I listen to my mate for? I'm smarter than he or she. The error of making this is, when we accept only our opinion, we shut out everything else. Again, our self-esteem, self-worth is not strong enough to accept input from others. How many... How many times have you said, don't tell me how to do it, I want to do it myself? What are you really saying is, is I don't want you to show me because you will appear smarter for more intelligence than I am. Because I have low self-esteem. It is an important look. It is important to look like I know what I am doing all the time. Or it could mean that you already know what's going on and you don't want them to appear that they're teaching you. We have to allow others to be our teachers. This doesn't mean that we want to accept everything that they have to say, but it does work to our advantage to at least listen to them and see if what they have to say is of value. And if it doesn't matter, who helps who helps you to show you? They help to show you anyway. The only thing that matters in the end is the result is a healthy response. If you could show me how to get these erase, to get these there better or faster, then I want to learn from you. When you are able to figure out how to get what you want and isn't, and it isn't because you're stupid, it's because you're conditioned not to go beyond your own present level of awareness if you can't get what you want. In the business, there is a tendency, there is a tendency to lock on, to approach. There's a lock on approaches that are traditional. This is the way that we have always done it. When we use this type of thinking, we lock on to the way that it was, we blind ourselves to the way it can be, and ask ourselves these questions. What ideas, beliefs, attitudes have I accepted? Is there an idea, opinion, attitude that I have not supported, that has not supported me in getting where I want to go, doing what I want to do, being, 
what I want to be, if there is, then you're, you'll be able and you'll be willing to let go of that idea, belief, and attitude and concentrate on the end result. You need to allow new information that will facilitate you in permitting the end result to get through. You need new information. You need to step back and say, I don't know. Step back and say, let me listen. Or allow others to be your teachers. I want you to recognize that you don't need to know anything about a particular subject you want to learn in business or want to go as far as an intro. Because the lack of experience is something or weren't good in the certain subject in school doesn't mean that you're not that just mean that you're incapable of learning it it just means that the information has to go about how it wasn't of a value to you at that particular time but watch how the information comes pouring through now that you have clearly defined what you want what I'm leading you to is this once you decide on how and what you want and how you want to live what you want to do and what you want from your group to accomplish or what you personally want to create, the process becomes exciting because the information will come through and you'll go out and you'll find a way to make it happen, gaining the cooperation of others. I also encourage you not only to make things happen for yourself, but also for your business, for your company, your family, your friends, your groups, the people you work with. It isn't, it isn't so much that we believe, but from which we can get the people around us to believe. The key is getting others to believe from the way that they are, as far as to see how capable they are, to think the way that they are, and to get them to stop dwelling in their own limitations, why something can't be done, or something about the past, if you want them to begin focusing their attention on their where they want to go and how and what they want to become, once again, the end result is the only thing that counts. When you have an idea and a belief and you are seeking to create something that you did not exist before, when you have an idea or belief and you're seeking to create something that has not ever existed before, a new product, service, business, or whatever, your problem won't be your belief in an idea, it'll be trying to convince the the those around you, that is, is it possible? In order to get help and cooperation from others to reach this goal, your biggest problem will be how to get others to believe in you. How can I get them to support me? This is the problem every leader faces. It isn't so much to meet, it isn't so much the matter from which the, the leader believes, but rather that the leader can get the people around him or her to believe. We know that everyone acts in accordance with the truth as they perceive it to be. If their perception of reality is faulty, this will come up in illogical reasons of why it won't work, why it can't be done, why it's impossible, why it's too difficult to accomplish. Remember, they are nor, in, they are nor intentionally trying to sabotage you or hold you back, but they're just acting in accordance with their own truths as they perceive it to be. Remember, that's their truths and how they perceive it to be. The challenge is how to lead people to believe that they can do more than they are ever thinking that they're capable of doing. Perhaps you could see that your children have potential, but it doesn't do you any good to see the potential if they can't see it. Your employee's potential or your mate's potential, but it is meaningless unless that they can see it because they must act in accordance with the truth as they perceive it to them and as they perceive it to be. Help others to change their level of expectations. Good leaders, parents, mates are able to help others to change their level of expectations, to change what they believe in is true. They are able to motivate them to believe in something that they did not believe in before and then help them with their self-talk and self-imageries and then make that belief into a reality. In order to do that, you can't just ask them to blindly follow you. People today are too sophisticated for that. As children, we were learned because of living in faith, very soon we become logical adults and we want logical reasons. We have to teach each other how to create from an idea, how to use the tools that we are learning throughout this book. If they are not willing to use these tools, they will do everything that they can to prove that they are right in believing what they believe, and in the end, they will either try to sabotage you or try to stop you, or try to, stop you to make themselves right. Surround yourself with can-do people. Can-do. Take a look at the people in your life. Who are you telling to? It can't be done. There's no way. I can't see this. It can be done. Are you allowing these people to determine whether you are capable or not? In essence, you are giving your power away to these people. If you are, make a decision to reclaim the power. What kind of people surround you and yourself and your type of business? What kind of people are you always around looking for reasons which, which it can't be done? Are you surrounding yourself with people who find solutions? Be very careful when choosing the kind of people from which you whom surround yourself because they strongly influence your creativity whether you realize it or not. Their negativity becomes contagious in your office, relationship, family, business. People who believe things can't be done will go out and prove themselves right. But people who know things can be done go out and make it happen. If you have a business, don't pay people to tell you to do something that can't be done. 
you can think of all the reasons why it can't be done. Be done yourself. You don't need to have people around you tell you that it can't be done. You can pay them. You don't have to pay them for that privilege. Surround yourself with people with high self-esteem who can tell you that it can get done and they can get the job done. How to make it happen and teach them to take and look for solutions instead of problems. Every strong leader sets a goal and then does whatever is necessary to make it happen. Every strong leader educates the people around him to start setting goals based on not only what is available, but on what they want to accomplish. This will help strong leaders and the people around you become more performances and become high performance people. In order to experience growth and change, you must learn to alter our level of expectation. To change our expectancy level, we must have a strong belief in ourselves and our goals. We must know we can take any idea and make it happen. Everybody else wants to see it before they believe it, but you must believe it before you even see it. And as you have more faith in your own power, you will transmit this to others. This, with this knowledge, with your own capabilities of those people around you, you could do anything that to others, seen unre that to others would seem unrealistic or even impossible. The real meaning of faith. What this all boils down to is having the ability to accomplish tasks that others find difficult or impossible. You have goals you see based on which is apparent, on which can be seen. You have and what you think is realistic. Don't base your goals on what you have or what you have done, but based on what you want to do and ultimately where you want to go. What we are talking about here is summed up in the one word, faith. Faith is not something religious or esoteric. It's a sound psychological and, physio and physiological fact that when you understand how the brain and mind functions together, the brain and mind functions together, then you will know that faith, which is believing before seeing, is the natural process of creation. Faith is believing before seeing. When you understand that, it is your belief or your faith in the ability to create that determines your results. You are then able to go out and accomplish tasks that other people think are impossible. You simply set your sights very high on what you want and then allow your information that will enable you to go out and create with your own stress and without effort to come through. The reality is whatever you are looking for, and the reality is that whatever you are looking for is at the same time looking for you. It all starts with believing before seeing.